This is Foodie Call on the G1 Podcast. Greetings, James here. Hi, I'm Chuck. Tom here. <laughs> and I am GP. We are Foodie Call on the G1 Podcast. Uh, what these guys didn't mention is where they come from, why they're important. James, Windy City Pizza, Chuck, Cali Kitchen, Tom over here is uh, the ambassador to the American, sorry, the chef to the American ambassador, yes, right? I'm not the ambassador. He's not the ambassador himself. <laughs> you wish you were. <laughs> Seriously. Kind of. Actually, yeah. A lot of benefits. Uh, okay. So what we're talking about today is authenticity um, in terms of cuisine versus catering to your target audience. If you missed last week's episode, or not last week's, the last episode, the very first one, what did we talk about, guys? We talked about uh, social media and how that pers- that kind of shapes uh, the perception of restaurants here, lines, things like that, neighbor blogs. We touched on the lack of aggregate food reviews, Yelp, the tasty road burn. Also, I took some shots at um, uh, Korean girls reacting to video. I thought I'd get called out a little bit but that has flown under the radar for now, thank goodness, right? <laughs> okay, um, let's get started. Authenticity versus catering to target audience. Let's, fight, let's get a baseline for where everyone stands in terms of authenticity. I'm from California, and um, a lot of people say uh, Mexican food from California is not really Mexican food. It's like California and Mexican food, like burritos aren't real Mexican food. But Actually, it is. Really? Yes, there is a Mexican burrito. Okay, well... There you go. I win. <laughs> Wait, who, who, who told you that burritos aren't Mexican food? Uh, I think someone in college. I don't remember. I've been told multiple but, times. But the Tex-Mex version of a burrito is very, very different than the Mexican version. That is true. So, uh, but there actually is a Mexican version or the Mexican version or the Mexican burrito. Okay. And okay. everything else is a version of it. Uh, so where I, where I think what I'm trying to get across is where you come from heavily skews your perception of authenticity so some people say that uh, Vietnamese food the best Vietnamese food is in California San Vietnam I would be heavily inclined to agree with that right Chuck over here also from California yeah you agree? yeah actually, okay. I, would, I would actually disagree with that really where do you think the best Vietnamese food is San Jose which is in California not, which is in California yes, yes but yeah. we said California what we're talking about? yeah no no but a different city California is a state, sir. I know, but <laughs> San Jose has the best Vietnamese food. Okay, so in we're California. all in agreement. So, man, <laughs> okay. I don't know what we're arguing about. We're all in, pretty much in agreement here. And uh, I, I place a high value on authenticity, or I thought I did. And then I went to Vietnam and I was like, yo, this is not as good to me. So mm-hmm. I kind of don't know where I stand on it. Let's go around the table. James, authenticity versus kind of what you're used to. You have a, a take on that? Um. Well, as far as I know, being out here, you have a lot of really, let's just say, fake versions of what the food is supposed to be. Um, As far as I'm concerned, you would like it to sort of be as authentic as possible, right? Ideally, of course. Right. If you're going to try and teach people about what food actually is, then it should actually taste like what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Okay. Um, Pretty much pretty easy to get along with that idea. There's a lot of sacrifices made. We'll dive into that in a little bit. Chuck? Your place is called Cali Kitchen. Right, right. So, I mean, we're trying to do food that we miss from California, um, uh, trying to be as authentic to the flavor profile as possible. But I guess uh, just going back to authenticity, um, I guess for me, we have to kind of define what it means to be authentic before we can say, hey, this is what we're trying to be. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but even like uh, for Italian food, um, like if you want to say, you know, it has to be from that region, then tomato-based like pasta sauces wouldn't necessarily be authentic because tomatoes came in late into the picture. Sure, sure. That's what I you know c- kind of understand. So for me, I guess uh, the way I define authenticity would be more about the intentions of like the origins and the flavors that are you know like you know part of that region or culture. I guess so. I think people mistake familiarity, like what their mom made, and also just like a specific regional That's a really thing good point. Yeah. to what authenticity actually is. You know, so. But for me, I guess, like, you know, because kimbap chungguk isn't authentic, you know. <laughs> you know, your cholado food does not represent Korea food in general, you know. Yeah, and and yeah. what your mom makes is not necessarily authentic to where you're from, you know. So I guess for me, authentic is really more about just, like, trying to capture the essence of, you know, what makes 
Because I think you can introduce like whether it's new techniques, new ingredients, and still have sure. authentic food. Sure. So yeah, that's an that's an interesting concept. New techniques, new ingredients, still authentic food. That's one I haven't thought thought about. Okay, Thomas, you are one of the bigger players here in terms of authenticity. I imagine. Uh, actually, don't. Really? Um, Where do you err on this? I actually don't believe everything has to be actually authentic. Um, I actually think that there is a place for non-authentic food. And the reason I say this is because even if you take the simple concept of a hamburger, the original hamburger is nothing like what we're eating today. The original hamburger was just basically a beef, beef patty. There was no cheese on it. There, were, there was no lettuce tomatoes. There was no onions. There, was, there were no pickles, special sauces. Uh, and this has evolved over time. So I don't believe that everything has to be truly authentic as long as you don't make an abomination of that original product. So as long as you're advancing that food, I think you're okay. Advancing is, uh, is highly subjective here. Sure. And <laughs> you know, it, but, it's, oh, go, go ahead. But when you start putting corn on a pizza, that's not advancing a pizza. That's actually just an abomination. So that has no play in it. But if you're actually improving a product, I think you can do that. And I'm all for it. Someone argued that if I sprinkled corn and put kimchi on you, you would be improved. It could be. <laughs> Should you know, we try that one day? That's that's kind of a thing, right? These uh, these improvements are highly subjective. And I guess we know what to do for the next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... If you've ever argued or not, it always kind of turns into an argument for me about um, sweet potatoes on pizza, um, corn on pizza, yes. uh, removing cilantro. Uh, one time I even got, I ordered Vietnamese food and when you get Vietnamese food, the red bottle is always sriracha. And or I'm a actually, fake version of it. Yeah, or something similar. I'm actually wearing a sriracha shirt right now. Yes, I love it. It's lovely. Right? Looks good. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm blushing. Uh, anyway, one time it was gochujang, and oh, I nearly oh, lost it. Oh. I almost flipped over the table, and but yeah, I, I controlled myself and realized I didn't want to get deported. Uh, that did happen right here in Itaewon, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, wh- where is this like this line? People get very heated. How, how do you define what is an improvement and what is a bastardization? Why is corn bad? Um, why is all of a sudden? It, there's this uh, was it cheese uh, tungalbi is really popular now <laughs> right I know, what, I know what you're talking yep. about like it's basically it's Korean sweet ribs with like cheese on top spicy ribs that's right? exactly what it is right so I, what I haven't had it yet I haven't had it I've, I've seen pictures I, I've of had it. It. I I've had it it's bad it is literally the sum <laughs> of its parts it is a pool of mozzarella and uh, you could just put the kalbi on it and, and the place has my namesake on it, you know. I'm not really happy about that either. <laughs> James, you t- seem to be very popular in these authentic original circles, uh, you know. Yes, in the uh, non-authentic I, authentic food circles. Yeah, so I hear you. What's going on with that? Uh, it's, I had nothing to do with it. Okay, so how would you guys define what is an improvement? Can you define what is improvement, or is it case by case? I don't necessarily know if it was a quote-unquote improvement. It was just sort of, you know, we're in Korea. And Koreans sort of cater to Korean tastes. And so they put toppings on things that they feel the Korean general would like. And, you know, in one sense... Or removing things that the Korean public doesn't like, like cilantro, for example. So when you come from America, and America and, let's say, Italy are the standards by which, let's say, pizza is judged. And so when you come here and you find corn and French fries and things like that on pizza, it's very easy to sort of be like, well, what the hell is this? You know, it's not pizza. You feel like you're watching Epic Mealtime. Right. But when you look around and when you take something like pizza and you look at what other countries do with it either, or also, it's not really any different in any country or over there. It's like every other country seems to have strange toppings on their pizza that, you know, the people there love. It's just very foreign to us. And maybe it's sort of an ego thing. We feel like, well, pizza is ours, so pizza should stay the way it is and, and it shouldn't have sweet potato in the crust and french but fries on the on the topic i would also imagine that a lot of italians like living in italy when they see like an american pizza they would feel the same way well the funny thing is they do they go there and they say that's not pizza but then when they're in america that's all they eat because it's like <laughs> junk food to them right they love it because it's just full of excess full of cheese full of sausage full of toppings so so you're actually kind of 
really liberal about this. You seem very, very accepting about all these different interpretations of food and it's something he I loves would never the corn eat. on the pizza. Right, I would never on the eat record, it, but I'm not going to begrudge them. You know their toppings because that's the one. You know because that's what sells. That's what they like to eat. Right. So, okay, uh, that's a that's a really peaceful diplomatic way to go about it. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I go into conversations sometimes guns ablaze and ready to def- to defend my position. Uh, okay, so the Korean interpretation of foods. We've we're at this point. Anything else to throw in before I move on to a little bit? I, I take a different spin on this conversation, guys. I, I mean, for me, I'm I'm actually very opinionated. Uh, somewhat in the other way, you know, where I feel like, uh, you know, I, I feel like a lot of Americans or, or foreigners get mad in Korea because they feel like their food has been bastardized. I mean, kind of like the Italians with the American thing as well. But I think you know, it's like, like, I think food can evolve, but when does it evolve in a bad way? You know, when does it evolve to uh, kind of corporate intentions or things that are not making it better per se, you know? And I feel like a lot of it is, is um, so this is just kind of a personal thing that I think is that when, when you t- change food too much to match the Korean public, then you're kind of dumbing it down for Koreans. And you're saying, oh, Koreans can't handle this. Koreans can't eat cilantro. Koreans can't eat this, you know, the way it's intended to be eaten. So you're, you're actually kind of uh, looking down on them. And I'm like, no, Korean people are smart. You know, like don't dumb it down for them, like serve it to them the right way and they'll appreciate it. But I think I agree with what Thomas said earlier is that food can evolve. For instance, um, at, at my restaurant, we tried using the beans, uh, but then, uh, you know, that we used back in the States. It didn't taste the same way we expected, so we started using lentils. But we try to keep the same flavor profile. So, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of things that evolve in a positive way. Like even Korean food tastes different in California versus Korea, but some things taste better in California. You know, I mean, you know. Which, what ones? No, I mean, uh, the easiest one would be like, uh, sundubu. I think sundubu is way better in California than, you know, it's, it's not even close, you know? And even Korean barbecue beef, at least, is I think it's, it's way better in California. Just to add on to what you're saying there, um, a lot of times when you are an expat, uh, particularly a Western one, and you go to a Korean restaurant, they will ask you, hey, do you want something that we wouldn't normally give to Koreans because right. we fear that you can't handle the spice. Right. And Usually it's- I was actually going to comment on that is because... There's a lot of Korean restaurants when when a foreigner goes in and basically they'll comment and they'll say, isn't this too spicy for you? And they'll immediately judge or and they'll recommend something like bulgogi, which is, you know, typical like sweet. And that's what they assume that the typical foreigner will eat. So I think that's on the vice versa side. Right. I think. Yeah, it's yeah. a that's a perfectly good point. You know, we don't want it dumbed down. And if you I think if you you know, give credit to the Korean public, they'll be able to accept it, or maybe they won't. You know, we're not representative of everyone, and certainly cilantro seems to be the exception there. Let's uh, kind of pivot on this topic a little bit. Foreign restaurants, especially here in Itaewon, uh, it's kind of a pattern. You start off as a hole in the wall, you have a customer base, they're super loyal, they talk about you, they bring their friends, um, they bring their Korean friends, you show up on a few blogs, you get popular, lines out the door, your menu starts changing, things get more expensive, and then you lose your original customer base. Is that right or wrong to cater to that new customer base, or should you stay firm with uh, where you are? Is it up to the discretion of the individual restaurant owner? How do you feel about that? I think it depends on what your intentions are, whether you got From the into, get-go? Where you, what, did you get into the restaurant business to make money or to make a statement with your cooking and your your food items so there are people who get into the restaurant business for the right reason or the wrong reason but it's about money and if you want to cater and dumb down your menu for a local scene that's perfectly fine i mean we all have different goals in life but personally i would not do that but there are people that would so i don't hold it against them as a restaurant owner and as a business person, but as a chef, I do hold it against them. But but, but is it more of a restaurant uh, question or is it like a business question? Because I think it happens in business. You know, it's, it's, of course, it's it more does. of a you know, it's like. But business is explicitly for making money. Restaurants kind uh, of have. I, I, I disagree with that. I think um, businesses have to make money to survive. 
but that's not their number one thing. You know, as in like, if, if that's your number one thing, then you lose sight of actually making a great product. But do you, do you think McDonald's is in it for the money or is are they in it for making a quality product? McDonald's, <laughs> McDonald's is, uh, there you go. Is, a, is a different thing, yeah. But they're but, at the top. No, but, but, profits, what, right? but, but what I would say is that um, at the core of it, they haven't really lost what they started for in the sense that their goal was to feed a lot of people very cheap. Yes. You know, and I think that hasn't changed, you know, and I think that's why they're, you know, monolithically su- successful and they're able to continue that way. I think when a company loses its compass of what it's about, that's what we're talking about. It's like, hey, if you're there, I mean, I think for me personally with food, it becomes a lot more personal because it's about feeding people and this like affects people's health and livelihood. And it's like, you know, it's like, like there's a Korean saying, like, don't play with your food. Don't mess with like, you know, stuff that affects people's like, you know, 장난하지마, you know, with like your food. And it's like, if you, you know, if it's like putting like, you know, like bad ingredients or rotten ingredients in your food, it's, it's uh, also something to take into uh into consideration here is that McDonald's, the original people that they fed are still the people that they're feeding as where the restaurants I'm kind of talking about, the people that they originally fed, um, those patrons like me at certain restaurants won't go there anymore just because, yo, bro, you changed. You changed, man. So you're specifically talking about selling out, right? I'm talking about selling out. Okay. I think it becomes a little bit different. It's it's tough to use McDonald's as an example because McDonald's as a corporation has a responsibility to its shareholders. Right, so it's not even almost about its hamburgers or anything like that. McDonald's is all about its stock, right? And so that's what they have to focus on. It just turns out that hamburgers and cheeseburgers and fries are what they do to, to make money. So, um, but restaurants, you know, when you when you look at smaller restaurants that aren't publicly owned, you know, um, that's where the issue becomes. Well, should they sell out and should they cater to the public or should they sort of hold true to their roots? And, and that's a little bit of a slippery slope because it's very easy to say, well, everything should stay authentic. You should hold firm to that. But if you're not making any money and if your customers aren't coming in because of that, well, then what are you supposed to do? You know, and I think that's why a lot of that trend happens to where um, they start to change the menu a little bit and cater to the Korean taste as opposed to, let's say, trying to educate them on, hey, what this is and why people like it. Um, but... I feel like slowly but surely things are changing because there's a lot of restaurants that are popping up in Itaewon and they're trying to hold true to their roots and they're really trying to educate Koreans about, hey, this is why it's this way, this is why it's this way. And the younger generation of Koreans, they I feel like they really want to know. They are hungry for right, they're, and they want to be educated, right? And exactly. If not for if if for nothing, you know, no other reason than they can brag to their friends that hey, they know what this is, and then, and then sort of that education sort of spreads. Um, you know, it'll be a while before it's immersed throughout the whole industry, but I feel like changes are slowly happening. Changes are slowly happening, and Korea takes them up pretty quickly. Uh, there's a whole philosophical debate in my head about whether these changes are advancements in society, in the restaurant scene, in whatever facet, or whether we're simply playing catch up, but that's not really the topic we're discussing right now. Um, I'm going to move on to something that I kind of feel hits everybody price, man. Does authentic warrant a higher price tag than comparably authentic in other countries where we're from and such. Um, for example, where I'm from in California, uh, Ban Mui, the Vietnamese sandwich, uh, when I was growing up, it was cheap. It was like three bucks. Now it's like, I think five, maybe six. Yeah. And I feel like I feels it. It's terrible. <laughs> like I, this is the food of my people. This is like what we have in, in street stalls. And oh, then you man. go here and it is uh, some places like in, a big Kwajum in department store, they might sell it for like eight. And in other places, I remember seeing it in Japan o- over, it was double digits. And that really? was just like, it, it betrays what the food is, food right. that is priced for everybody. And also, you know, just because it might be authentic, I, it wasn't in my opinion, um, they felt like they could charge a lot. Do you feel like authentic warrants a higher price tag? Given, you know, Let's say that the ingredients aren't ridiculously expensive. That, that's what it boils down to is whether right. the ingredients are readily available and whether the ingredients are cheap enough to be able to deliver it. But just based on the fact that it, you're trying to serve an authentic product, it should not raise the price up. Um, but I don't know. No, let's, I agree. 
let's um let's take this into perspective koreans that go to they go study abroad they always come back and they they tell me yo i paid like 14 dollars for this kimchi jjigae in new york and it was it tasted like it came out of like a rain gutter but i was so happy like you've heard this story before right but but let me tell you uh, so so thomas and i have a ongoing debate about this about you know, but for me, I think New York, like New York, has some horrible Korean food. I mean, not all of New York, but basically New York, Koreatown, or whatever. You know, it has. I, I wouldn't say horrible. No, it has pretty bad Korean food. It, it, <laughs> and, and actually, I agree with you Sounds here like that East LA, versus West kind of thing. LA actually <laughs> does have better Korean food than New York. Yeah, let's I'll, leave it at that. I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> but on the other hand, there's a lot of things that New York has that's better than LA. I, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. But so, I mean, I, I totally agree with what you're saying about that, you know, uh, but I'm actually distracted because I want to ask you a question. Have you had a good bun me in Korea? Have I had a good bun? I had a uh, passable one. Um, I have not had one where I was like, this hit all the bases for Did me. Did you have one that had pate in it? No, that's oh, a man. solid no. And I actually asked the um, the the best uh, place that I went to that had bun me. I asked him, hey, how come you don't have pate? And he said, it just comes down to space and price. And uh, there's like, and I was like, uh, well, can't you just charge more for it? It does. It's like a tin, right? And there seemed to be a lot of excuses. And I was just like, you know, right. Other than the volume of meat, I like how you're looking at me. Like you really feel like, oh man, you're really hurting GP. <laughs> no, I, I wanted to know because I've been looking for a good bond meat place myself. There's one. I know. I know a decent one. If you're really craving it, but if you're like fresh from California or Vietnam, maybe wait a year before you go. It'll uh, taste better. Well, if it doesn't have pate in it, I don't want it. That's what I'm saying. There's I mean, one place you can get it. I mean, if they're serving meatballs or they're serving like Americanized or like Americanized meatballs, I do not want this. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on a little bit. Um, unless you guys have any, anything to add to add about that last part there. Well, about pricing. I mean, um, you can always actually just. The simple thing is, even in America, there is pasta, and the food cost on pasta is dirt cheap. Yeah. So these restaurants are serving pasta for, let's say, $15, or here in Korea for 20000 won. Do you think that's fair? I don't, quite frankly. You know, but... But... Unless there's time in preparation, uh, But for like something that. as simple as, let's say, spaghetti with meatballs, or pasta marinara, or... You know, any any of these things which are very very cheap to prepare, but these restaurants are charging fifteen dollars or let's say twenty thousand won for it, and it comes to the point where is it really worth it? No matter how authentic it is, I think uh, sometimes what you're paying for is the ambiance of a restaurant True. and the service. And I'll give that like uh, yeah, of course that deserves to be paid for, but some places are just absurd, and I'm never willing to get you know I'm, I'm just not willing to spend my money that way. Right. Yeah. But but what are people paying for? I mean, in the sense of, I mean, Cali Kitchen has kind of low prices, in my opinion. But in the really? sense of, huh? Really? <laughs> yeah, as in, uh, based on, no, that's just my opinion. But but of for course. me, I think authenticity has nothing to do with price, you know? Authenticity is judged by its own merits of like, hey, is this really like cutting true to home? And then I think the price has to do with what people are paying for. Like you said, it might be ambiance, it might be the food. But for some people, it's that nostalgia. I think, you know, the guy who's paying 14 bucks for, you know, kimchi jjigae in New York, which is a very poor version of kimchi jjigae, he's still happy because of the fact that it's nostalgia that he's buying right there, right? Actually, I used to pay 12. Okay, so you got but, a deal. But I had no choice. See, that's the thing. There's no choice. Yeah. But for me, I feel like uh, ingredient costs, even for me, when we buy uh, ingredients in Korea, sometimes they're easily double, triple, and they shouldn't be. But easily double triple what we would get in the states you know so when you have to work with that it's it makes it difficult i want to offer a cheaper product we can't do it you know yeah especially when the ingredient prices are high and things like that things are just hard to get in general uh, preparation time ambiance those are all considerations we take into when we're going out somewhere especially if you're um, going on a date you know you do want to set the mood you don't want to take them to that hole in the wall or that kimbap chungguk unless or cali kitchen Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, the, the belt. That escalated quickly. 
Uh, if you, <laughs> if this oh, is Chuck the first hates me now. Time, I know, I know. I'm like, what's? What do you mean now? I know. If this is the first time you're tuning into a foodie call, we kind of caught a glimpse of this uh, this feud between all three of these guys and the zero confidence they had for you during your food eating contest, Thomas. <laughs> But you know what? To their defense, they were they were right, man. You you mm. for middle of the pack, middle of the pack. Quite disappointing. Uh, you can check out that video. I'll link it somewhere uh, in the description, or if you're watching via the visual podcast, it'll appear on screen. Okay, let's um, let's move on to this debate. Is there room for both? Is there room for this? Um, is there room for pizza with corn? And then let's say Chicago deep dish. Is there room for this fusion food, some of this stuff, mm-hmm. anything that says Asian bistro, I try to stay away from. Is there room for that? And then there is there room for the legitimate stuff that I'm used to. Oh, ab- absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there there is room for all levels of restaurants. Uh, not everybody has the same preferences. Not everyone has the same standards for food. So you do have to cater cater to a different market. And there needs to be restaurants that provide that service for these people and for people like me and for people like Chuck and for people like James. I mean, so we actually, the three of us may not have the same taste in food. I think I have, um, I have trust issues is like my main thing, you know, because okay. if it's a Vietnamese restaurant and I keep going back to this example because I am Vietnamese and it's not because I am Vietnamese, it's because I'm Vietnamese and everybody always asks me like at some point during our friendship, like, Hey, where, where's the best place to get pho? And I'm, I, I will actually tell you. And, and what's we'll your answer? Uh, we'll get to that when we get to the stuff we like portion. <laughs> All right. Um, but yeah, how do you feel? Is there a middle ground? A lot of these places like to advertise as being authentic. And that's up for debate. But I think the problem is, is uh, like false advertising, misrepresentation. You know, when you say you're authentic, but you're not. Um, I think it's fine when you're, when you're doing what you say you're doing. But a lot of times you're not. I think that's the biggest problem. And I think fusion, when it's done right, it's really great. But when it's done poorly, like most of the time, it's you're confusion. like... confusion. Yeah, it's confusion. It's it's like, what the heck is this? Why would you do this, you know? And in more ways than just the, the food industry, you know, in, in terms of English media, which is what gave rise to this podcast, and a whole bunch of other things you see here as well, not just, you know, the fusion foods, um, not just cheese galbi, right? James, is there room for middle ground in your belly? Um, middle ground meaning if a restaurant is sort of trying to go from let's say authentic to less authentic uh, I don't know about that middle ground I, if it's a function of is there room for both to coexist well it, it's sort of happening right now so apparently there is you know there are very authentic places that do well and there are not so authentic places that do well um, but you know like the previous comment I think you sort of have to take a stand and you, you sort of have to know who you are. And, and I think, you know, that's where everything comes through. All right. Well, there we have it. There's our take on uh, authenticity versus catering to your target audience. It seems like we're very diplomatic here. I think uh, the biggest loser was not either the authentic restaurants or the restaurants that I would label as selling out. But um, all the jabs we took at Chuck and Cali Kitchen today, unfortunately, <laughs> we do have to say it is worthy of your money and a great burger. But let's finish up, as we always do, with stuff we like. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw out the topic. I actually haven't prepared you for what the topic is, unfortunately. Uh, It is the most authentic whatever. It doesn't have to be food, man. It could be the most authentic Thai massage if you want, if you know a place. I'm looking at you, Thomas. Uh, I'll go ahead and go first, since I teased it earlier. The most authentic Vietnamese um, pho I've had is definitely... um, it's that place in Wang Ximri, but I'm not going to recommend it because it's just terrible to get to. And it's in a food court, so even when you get there, you have to kind of go into a basement. You don't even know if you're there, and that's really awkward. Aren't there, aren't there two of them? And there are yeah. two of them, yeah. and you don't know which one you're at. And that's just a nightmare. I'm not going to dedicate time to go out and do that. Uh, instead, I'm, gonna rep- I'm going to recommend Amoi. E-M-O-I over in Jongkok. Extremely easy to find. Reasonably priced. Uh, when I walked in, they were playing Vietnamese music and not the abrasive kind that my mother listens to, but like the, the kind of the soothing. Sorry, mom. And happy birthday. <laughs> there you go. Her birthday was Saturday. Um, that one, uh, that place actually has Vietnamese uh, chefs as well. Okay. And reasonably priced. Right. And it's an open kitchen, right? 
Uh, you can see kind into the kitchen. Like, yeah, so that's always a plus as well. How'd you feel about like the the Hanoi style noodles? I mean, they make their noodles fresh. Yeah, yeah. I, that was kind of weird at first because huh. that's not what I'm used to being right, from Northern right. California. Yeah, that's why I asked. Uh, but really, it's just uh, it, it's a minor detail because their right. broth is on point. Like they, there's a really great pho place over here that I'm willing to go to, and their noodles are more of what I'm used to. Yeah, their broth is not as good in my right. opinion. Pho for you. And it's like San Francisco right. style Vietnamese right. food, and I was like, "I'll be the judge of that." Right, <laughs> right. Yo, they get my thumbs up. They yeah. get my thumbs up too. But definitely Emma and Jongkok. If I had a choice, if I was going for more authentic, that place. How do you like the broth when you order there? If you don't mind me asking. Which place? Uh, Emily. Emily. I like it a lot. No, I like the... no, because they have uh, two options. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I always, I always get the more expensive one. I haven't actually tried the other one. Uh, so, so the ordering tip would be to get the the special. Yeah, get the special. Get the special, but you can actually ask for more of the regular broth, and they'll give you more of that for free. Ooh, I didn't know and, that. And uh, you can ask for more noodles for free as well. So you can actually get both if you play your cards right. And I'm like questioning what I'm still doing here, talking to you guys. You'll be doing that. Also, <laughs> their other food, um, they have a um, the greens. Uh, the, yeah, it's um, it's kind of like a bibimian, but the Vietnamese, I don't know what it's called in English. It's called a Bong tet nương and it's dry noodles. That's on point as well. Anyway, I've talked too much. Let's go with uh, with Thomas. Authentic recommendations, food uh, or otherwise. Very very easy one for me in terms of food would be Wolfgang Steakhouse in Cheongdam Dong. Uh, it's almost nearly identical to the one that's in New York, so that's a very very easy recommendation. And a lot of people say, "Well, isn't it more expensive?" Well, yes, but here in Korea, there there is no tipping. There are no taxes, so when you can do the conversion rate for the exchange, it comes out almost the same price as you would pay in New York. So that's a very very easy recommendation for me. You have a particular entree to recommend? I usually get the two kilogram porterhouse. You you have four and a half pounds of meat. Yes, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but porterhouse. It's, it's a lot of bone, right? Uh, I would say it's about one pound of bone in there. I would so. say it's about okay. 500 grams. So yeah. you're talking about um, still a little bit over three pounds of meat. How there. much does that cost? Just wondering. Uh, that costs 400,000 won, which would be approximately $400. Yeah. Okay. So that's like on the polar opposite and end of MI, which costs about, I think, 12 thousand <laughs> yeah, i think less i think it's like ten thousand a hey, different strokes for different folks yeah right? different so yeah well we got to give wallet. a range of recommendations here so yeah okay chuck um and, and don't recommend cali kitchen well now that you say that i feel like i have to <laughs> um i guess uh I, i'm actually gonna just just spin it differently since you guys both did food and you mentioned thai massage i i do i feel like thai massages you can get a good deal in korea uh, sure, absolutely. For, for about like 30,000 won. I think you can get an hour and a half. If you, uh, and, so, and the, the main thing is if you, there's a couple places. I think there's one place in Gangnam, and then there's another place like near here somewhere that I probably won't tell you guys. Um, but the place in Gangnam, uh, I don't remember the name, but I will, I will let you know, and you can put it in the notes or whatever. But they actually have uh, like Thai massage place in Thailand. So and so they actually like rotate their their workers and like I guess from their Taiwan location as well. So it's just kind of actually like it if you you feel legit because you actually have Thai people and when you say Sawadee Kup they understand and like you're like did you get the Wapo training and you know a lot of them have. Okay, cool. Yeah. Kind of when you said they swap out their workers, that kind of makes me ask like it seems kind of questionable, but if it's legit, it's legit. Happy right? ending. <laughs> Oh my gosh! No, all it, right, it's, James. It's a James, very legit. Go ahead and uh, with your authentic. Um, well, sort of along the same lines as Thomas with the steak. Uh, I think probably one of the more authentic meals I've had was probably a Laurie's prime rib. Um, it's very true to its roots. It's very retro. It's very eighty style. Slow roasted prime rib. The salad's made the same way it's done um, back in the states, and it's just. Good, honest food, prime rib, mashed potatoes, peas, you know, those type of things. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be around very much longer. Yes. Just because there doesn't seem to be a really big audience for that. And, uh, you know, they might have done well maybe five, ten years ago. But these days, people would rather have their steaks sort of flash seared and cooked quickly versus the type of food that's sort of been sitting in the oven for a long time. So we'll see what happens, but... 
also, especially here in Korea, I don't think Korean people actually get prime rib. I think they see it more as a roast beef and they associate it with a cheaper kind of meal. And I don't think they're willing to pay those prices that Lowry's are t- is charging. So, How much is it at Lowry's? It depends on the cut. I see. It used to be more expensive, but these days, you know, they do 20% yeah. specials, yeah. 50% specials. Um, yeah, they're it doing, just shows that they're hurting. Yeah. Right. Well, you can uh, take advantage of that. Hopefully, they'll stay open because authentic in my book is always a good thing. Um, that'll wrap it up for today. Gentlemen, for Foodie Call, this is GP. James. Chuck. And Thomas. We'll catch you again in two weeks.